Hi everybody and thank you again for joining me on another episode of Gaffer and Gear. In today's episode, I'm going to do a review of the Small Rigs RC60B. So this is a small 60 watt bicolor light. Now, unlike other lights in this size, this one boasts an internal battery. It has the regular CCT range from 2700 Kelvin all the way up to 6500 Kelvin. And its other point of difference is it has superior color render. All right, so let's jump straight into the pros and cons, starting with the cons first to get those out of the way. And the biggest con for me with this is the limited amount of accessories that you've got. You've pretty much got their softbox and their standard dish that is supplied with it. Now the light does have a mini bow and mount, but here's the issue. There are at least two to three other brands out there with a mini bow and mount, and they've all settled on a standard, but this is not compatible. So third party accessories like Fresnels and projection mounts do not fit this light and vice versa, you can't fit the small rig stuff onto the other brands. The next potential negative, and only really for professional users, is this doesn't have any DMX control. It has a beautiful user interface on the side, and it has phone app control, but no DMX whatsoever. The next possible negative is the standard kit doesn't come with a power supply for charging or running the light simultaneously. Now the next possible negative for professional gaffers is the battery shoe that mounts on the back. This has a lot of pros by the way, but in terms of just one negative, they constantly talk about this thing being able to run off V-mount. Now if you're running a little camera V-mount battery, that's fine, but if you're a gaffer, chances are you're running high capacity batteries and they don't fit into the shoe. The next negative is a lot of these high capacity batteries, the USB port is a USB-A standard out and it won't power the light. Now the last possible negative for me is to do with charging. So when this is charging, the fan is constantly running. So that makes a lot of sense. That's keeping the battery system cool and extending the longevity of your investment. But here's my issue. When it's finished charging, the display stays on saying 100% charged and the fans keep running. So if you're topping this up with a USB-C battery pack, that's an unnecessary power suck. All right, let's get into the pros now. And the overwhelming pro with this light, which nobody seems to be talking about, is its color render. If you have a look at the spectrum distribution here, you can see that these guys have added additional violet phosphor. This helps fill out the spectrum range, giving this light very good SSI scores. In fact, superior to a lot of the lights that I use. The next pro for some people will be the internal battery. If you're doing a lot of work where you have to run around and follow the camera, well, there's no cable connected between you and the battery that's gonna get tangled. You also don't have any external battery that's gonna come loose if you're running around like crazy. Now, I can't emphasize this enough. If you're buying a light with an internal battery, you really should read the instruction manual thoroughly. These guys have gone to a lot of effort with their battery management systems to make sure you're gonna get the longevity of your battery and it's gonna be safe. For example, the light won't charge below zero degrees Celsius, and if your ambient temperature is above 40 degrees Celsius, it also won't charge. And also, if the battery is above 62 degrees, this can limit and turn off the battery system. Now, I've done a lot of testing with this over the last couple of weeks, and at no point have any of these things kicked in. So you really do need to be working in some adverse weather conditions. Now, despite the majority of the bill being made out of plastic, the bill quality is superb. The mounting area underneath is solid metal and does have RE pins. So if you're using the small rig clamps, this thing won't rotate on you if you've got it mounted to a car or something like that. The next thing that's a pro is the weight of the unit. Despite having an internal battery, it is lighter weight than a Forza 60C. And the light does have the usual run of the mill special effects that you'd expect. Now let's talk about the pros of the battery shoe. It connects really easy to the light. And if you're using USB battery packs, piece of cake. Now, just something to note with the USB battery packs, these guys recommend a USB-C to USB-C that can output 65 watts minimum. Now, what I have found in my testing is if the light is charging and running simultaneously, it can pull up to 92 watt. So that is something to consider. Now, if you're using an older battery pack like this, which is not USB-C compatible in terms of its power output, the light can detect what voltage is coming in or what wattage is coming in and compensate for that but it is worth reading the instruction manual. They do go to the effort of pointing out that if you're gonna do this constantly over a period of say like three months, it can actually damage the light. 
Okay, let's go over cost and what you get for your money. So the prices listed here are the average prices that I found online today, just doing a Google search. You can get it a bit cheaper and it does sell a bit more expensive at some other retailers. Okay, so for that money, you get the bag. The bag is very well constructed and does a fantastic job of looking after the light. Everything is in a beautifully cut out segment, so nothing's gonna get damaged in transport. Okay, first off, you get your instruction manual. All right, let's take a look at the light. Now the light does come with a silicon protective cap for the CAB area, but I wouldn't be too worried if you lose that because the light does have a protector over the CAB anyway. All right, let's have a look at the user interface. The user interface consists of an LCD screen and a mode button. The mode button will toggle between the effects and the CCT mode. To set your parameters, you've got your two knobs on the side here. The knobs are very well constructed and have a rubber finish, so they feel really nice to operate. On the back of the light, you've got an eco button. This eco button basically drops the power down to 60% and turns the fans off. So it's pretty much a fan off mode. Now in terms of the fan noise, I don't think it's gonna be an issue unless you're really, really close to the talent. So at about that far away, I don't think you'd hear it if you're outside. Now in the center on the back is the power input, which is USB-C only. And next to that, you've got your on off switch. So this thing is really basic to operate. On the bottom of the light, you've got your mounting section, which is three quarter of an inch thread with RE pins. And that section is metal. Okay, let's start going through the rest of the kit. You get your stand mount, which just screws into the bottom, nice and simple. And again, using those RE pins, it means that it's not going to slide around on you once it's mounted, okay? So that gives you your pan and tilt options, and it also has an umbrella mount. Next thing in the kit is a carry handle, which screws into the same section. Now these guys also have you covered in terms of all of your cable options. You've got a small USB-C to USB-A cable. You've got a small USB-C to USB-C cable. And they give you a three meter USB-C to USB-C cable. So you're really covered in terms of your cable use. And all of these cables are made from rubber. They're not PVC plastic rubbish. The next thing in the kit is a standard faceted dish, which gives you about three times the light output compared to having it with no reflector on. And you get the funky battery shoe. Now, an optional extra for this to consider is their mini dome. So it comes with a grid and it comes with a bag. Now it's very quick to assemble. It's just one of those rod click into place systems. It does take a few seconds, but nothing too long. You're not having to to play around with separate rods or loose components. But in terms of pack up, check this out. It's got a very beautiful quick release system. And there you go, all packed up. Now, in terms of the build quality of this, this really is sensational. It's got a high quality reflector and all of the stitching is superb. Okay, let's have a look at how the light performs. First off, with no modifiers attached. As you'd expect, it has a very wide, even beam. regardless of the CCT that you dial in. And the shadows are razor sharp. Now let's have a look at how it goes with its supplied reflector. And this is a multifaceted dish for maximum output. It intensifies the light to about three times the amount of light output. As far as a faceted dish goes, this is definitely one of the better ones. And the results are the same regardless of the CCT dialed in. But the shadows are not that great. Now let's take a look with the optional dome. And the build quality on this dome is really surprising for the price point. Now I was concerned that the deep recess in the mount would result in the reflector not being utilized. But the bulk of the reflector is picking up the light and doing a very good job of evenly illuminating the diffuser. And the results are what I would expect from a small softbox like this. And as you'd expect from quite a small soft light, it does round out the shadows a little bit. Now let's have a look at it with its grid attached. 
This is with the grid attached, and this is without the grid attached as a comparison. Okay, now let's start going through all the data I've collected, starting off with the external DC power draw. The maximum power draw I've recorded over several days of testing is 93 watts, and that is when the light is running and simultaneously charging its battery. Now let's take a look at the dimming characteristics. According to my frequency meter, this light is not running pulse width modulation, as in the light is running constant output with no frequency, which would make it 100% flicker free at any frame rate. Let's take a look at the dimming characteristics at 3200 Kelvin. I've taken readings at 100%, 50%, 25%, 10% and 5%. The maximum variation from the target CCT was 95 Kelvin. Above 10% brightness, it scores a 97 TN30 color RF, which drops to a 96 from 5% and below. But what is amazing at 3200 Kelvin is there is virtually no green or magenta shift as you were dimming the light. Now let's take a look at the dimming characteristics at 5600 Kelvin. The CCT is very consistent. The maximum it was ever off the target value was 98 Kelvin. It has very good TM30 color render scores of 97 and 96. And as you dim it, the light does skew a little bit towards magenta, the total amount being still less than one half of a 1 8 gel equivalent, which is quite impressive for a potentiometer dimming system. Now let's take a look at the average CCT accuracies. And all of these readings have been taken with no modifier attached. Now let's have a look at the TM30 RF color scores. And again, these readings have been taken with no modifier attached. As you can see across almost all of its range, it's scoring a 97. Now let's take a look at the white point measured in Delta UV. Now I'm not gonna give averages because as a bicolor light, this light tracks linear. It can't track to the daylight or Planckian curve. At its lowest CCT of 2700 Kelvin, it is the most it is above the planking curve with a delta UV of plus 0 0.0047. At 3100 Kelvin, it crosses the planking curve with a delta UV of minus 0 0.0008. At 3200 Kelvin, it comes in with a delta UV of minus 0 0.0013. At 4400 Kelvin, the light is the furthest below the planking curve that it gets to with a delta UV of minus 0 0.0038. At 5600 Kelvin, it crosses the planking curve curve again with a delta UV of plus 0.0001 and at its top Kelvin 6,500 it has a delta UV of plus 0.0021. Okay let's take a closer look at some of our CCTs starting off with the lowest Kelvin that we can dial in. When I dialed in 2,700 Kelvin, I got 2,717. The TN30 color render results were 96% average color accuracy with an average 97% color saturation. With the CRI scores, R9 and R12 were below 90. Here is the spectrum distribution. And the white point came in with a delta UV of plus 0.0047, which would give the light at this point a green hue to the equivalent of a one quarter correction gel. When I dialed in 3,200 Kelvin, I got 3,246 with an SSI score of 90. The TN30 color render results were 97% average color accuracy with an average 101% color saturation. All of the CRI scores are plus 90. This is the spectrum distribution. And the white point came in with a delta UV of minus 0.0013, which will give the light a slight magenta hue to roughly one half of a one eighth correction gel. When I dialed in 4,400 Kelvin, I got 4,451. The TN30 color render results were 97% average color accuracy with an average 103% color saturation. With the CRI scores, only R12 is below 90. Here is the spectrum distribution and note the second blue or violet peak, which gives it that extra color render. And the white point came in with a delta UV of minus 0.0038, which would give this light at this point a magenta hue split somewhere between a 1 8 and a 1 quarter correction gel. When I dialed in 5,600 Kelvin, I got 5,619 with an SSI score of 87. The TN30 color render results were 97% average color accuracy with an average 103% color saturation. All of the CRI scores are plus 90, here is the spectrum distribution, and note that violet spike which is giving the extra color render. And the white point is almost smack on the Planckian curve with a delta UV of plus 0.0001. But if your camera's working to the daylight curve, that would make this light slightly magenta 
to a little bit more than a 1 8 correction gel. When I dialed in 6,500 Kelvin, I got 6,565. The TM30 color render results were 97% average color accuracy with an average 101% color saturation. With the CRI scores, only R12 is below 90. This is the spectrum distribution. And the white point comes in with a delta UV of plus 0.0020. All right, so just my closing thoughts on this. I can't believe the value for money that you can get these days. When I started out, we had these small little HMI units called sun guns, and they cost thousands of dollars and pretty much did exactly the same as this thing does for a fraction of the price. Plus it's bicolor and dimmable. Now this thing is definitely not for me because it doesn't have DMX and it's not RGB, which is sort of the more the workflow that I do, but as a portable little unit with its internal battery and its color render, I can see this being handy for people who have to shoot on the fly. You want that little bit of fill on the face, the color render's great, and the internal battery means you've got no cable mess. Okay, see you on the next episode of Gaffer and Gear. Don't forget to click like and subscribe.